Just waiting for them to finish the room. start so I'll get cracking because obviously the day's running a little late. Um, hi, um, uh, my name is Andy. Um, I am technical director at Full Six, which is a small web agency in town. I've been working in web for a, a little over 15 years, so pretty much from the beginning of it. Um, I'm not going to say too much about myself, but um, I, I originally put this presentation together about a month ago for my incoming CEO because he knew absolutely nothing at all about digital. Um, and then I found that loads of other people in the agency which is weird because we're a digital agency, also didn't seem to know much about the technology of both digital. Um, and then the more that I've been talking about this, the more I've been realising that, that, that people don't really seem to kind of know a lot of the fundamentals about it. Um, so I, I want to start by just kind of saying who this is for, um, just so you, firstly you can make sure you're in the right room and, and also um, that you don't panic that this is going to be really, really geeky. If that's not your thing, it's totally my thing. Um, so, really, this is kind of not aimed at developers. Um, I don't know if we've got developers in the room, but it's not necessarily aimed at developers because this is going to be some fundamentals type stuff. Although some developers that even I know will find it a useful refresher in some ways, or maybe uh, like the way that it gets put across. Um, and so, really, the big question is: if you're not a developer and you have no interest in being a developer, but you are interested in working in digital in a number of different roles, and that might be as a designer, it might be as a project manager, it might be as a product owner, it might be even as a CEO or as a, 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 a kind of business-led uh, thing, but, uh, and even actually, to be honest, these days in anyone doing business within the digital age, um, these things are fairly fundamental to how the web works, how we build for the web, how we make things for the web, and I think it is um, uh, a really useful little primer and just some of the fundamental technologies that, that drive these things um, hopefully make it a little bit more accessible. I think the other thing is that there's been a really great drive recently to getting people involved in coding. So some of you, some of you may have done Code Academy, some of you may have dabbled a little bit or uh, done other, other things like that. Um, you know, also a lot of the new tools, things like Creative Cloud and that kind of thing, um, do generate code for you or let you quickly mock things up or prototype. Um, and that's also really fantastic. Um, and again, what I'm finding with that is that a lot of uh, designers in particular that I know that go and learn JavaScript or do a Code Academy class or that kind of thing or do training courses with Academy class or wh whatever it is, um, they get kind of straight into knocking out code and they start writing JavaScript and they start writing HTML. Um, but when they come to actually implement it in a real world situation, um, they, they often struggle with some of the fundamental reasons why a browser renders things the way it does. Um, so these are the things that I'm going to cover, and I'm going to rattle through some of it. Um, I, 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 we're going to look briefly at the history, because I'm sure you all know the history of the internet. Um, we're going to look at HTTP in particular. Um, we're going to look at the stack, or what developers call the stack. Um, the critical rendering path, which is how a browser actually displays a web page. We're going to look at APIs, which you will come across quite a lot. Um, and then we're going to look at a kind of few other things in, in a lot less detail, which are more kind of common terms that you might come across, and just very, very briefly look at, uh, at, at how some of these things work. So this is a primer, really. This isn't um, uh, you know, a big kind of geeky dump out. It's really just kind of uh, looking at some of the fundamentals of things. So let's start with the web. So I'm sure most of you kind of know this. So the web has been about since the late 60s. Um, uh, sorry, not the web. The internet, rather, has been around since the late 60s. Um, uh, and it really came out of a very fundamental technology called TCP IP. Um, the P in most of these acronyms stands for protocol. And all a protocol is is an agreed method of doing something. It's like a common language. So when one computer says to another, speaks to another computer, they can understand each other. Um, and um, TCP IP is this transmission protocol. Um, most of us in the room, what we use every day is the World Wide Web. 
Um, but TCP IP actually runs across thousands of ports, and there's loads of different protocols and loads of different services. So some that you might be, might be familiar with will be FTP, for instance, which is File Transfer Protocol. Um, uh, HTTP runs on port 80, so each one of these has a, its own little port and um, will transmit things via that port. Um, everything from the connectivity of your online game um, to uh, the way your phone connects to certain things, any point of connection is being made over TCP IP. Um, the really important thing about this, because I don't propose to kind of go into any great depth about how it works, but the most important thing is it's a standard. And as a standard, it hasn't really massively changed. Even though the web and the internet and being digital and everything that we do has evolved around it, the standard has remained the same. And pretty much every single transaction that you do uh, in any digital form is done over this. Um, there's also other things like DNS, which resolves domain names, and we could really kind of go deep into that. Um, um, but come see me later. Okay. So this is a technology which is constantly evolving. Um, and the web itself has been evolving since the late 80s. And these, for me, are the kind of different eras that we've gone through, maybe. Um, so the internet was what we were just talking about, a fundamental way of, of computers connecting to each other, regardless of their system architecture, a universal transmission protocol for data. On top of that, Tim Berners-Lee, obviously, came up with the web. And the web was really nothing more than a way of relating documents together um, through uh, through um, hyperlinks. So it was a structure, uh, a coding language called HTML, which um, was just a markup language, nothing more. It just allowed you to take a document of text and give each part of that text some form of structure. It was a universal structure, so it could be shared and then it could be linked to other documents around the web. <coughs> it's pretty much when I kind of got into it. Um, web 2.0 came along in the kind of early 2000s and um, this started to become more application focused. So you could start to do stuff on the web, not just consume information. You could connect to services and you could connect to structured information. You could do commerce and transactional kind of stuff. Um, after that came the social web, which you know is still very prevalent now. And that became more about not connecting people to documents or people to services, but that became about people to people or people to businesses directly. Um, Part of that was a big shift in the specification, which led to the semantic web. So this was HTML5, amongst other things. And that is about making the content itself of the page be a lot more active, be a lot more understandable, make more sense. Um, and so now we're in this kind of situation where we're not really talking about websites anymore. We're really talking about services that all link together. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, the final thing, which, you know, particularly with Apple's announcement this week, where I think we really are on the brink of, is now about connecting people to their lifestyles and people to their environment. So uh, wearables are obviously going to be a big thing. You've probably all heard about the Internet of Things as well. And really this is about taking that fundamental transmission protocol and many of the standards that we'll talk about here and allowing you to connect to everything in your kind of life. This is constantly evolving. There is no master plan. We have the W3C that kind of likes to think it, it is, and we have obviously people like Adobe and uh, uh, you know, uh, commercial companies, Microsoft, Oracle, Google, all of these companies that like to push it. But I think the amazing thing about the web at the moment is it's largely driven by us. It's largely driven by the people that use it and build it. Um, standards by adoption. You, know, uh, you can see, uh, this is just a kind of diagram of, of different web technologies and their implementations in browsers, and you can see how very kind of corporate release cycles all the way up to here, then kind of Chrome comes in with a rapid release cycle and messes everything up. And we're just building like new technologies every single month, new standards, new techniques, new ways of, of doing things, you know, for developers in particular. But I think for everybody, every discipline within the um, uh, within this, this medium, it's very, very, very hard to kind of keep hold of things. Um, it is constantly evolving. The standards are not sent centrally. You can't really do a training course in a lot of it because a lot of training materials will be relevant as soon as they're written. It's really something to immerse yourself in and live and, and constantly work with. And, and also build yourself, push things forward, make your own decisions. And I think that's a really probably the single most exciting thing about working in digital as opposed to other media. Right, so let's get a little bit techy now. So HTTP, for me, this is the single most important thing that anybody working in digital should understand. Like it literally, if there's just one thing, this is the thing to kind of know. Because this is the fundamental protocol which is about the transaction of information on the internet. So pretty much any, with some 
some exceptions, but pretty much any transaction that you make is going to be made over HTTP or one of its variants. So what is HTTP? Well, it's basically just a call and response. Um, so, you know, just like the Who song, shout out a line, you get a response back. Um, so you have a requester. Now, that requester might be your browser when you type in a web address. Um, it might be another service. It might be another server talking to another server. It might be your fridge shouting out to Sainsbury's like we keep being told is going to be the amazing new feature. Um, it sends this message out to a unique address of another server, and then that server gives it a response. And that's basically all it is. So it sends a request out. It says, I would like this piece of information. And it brings it back and it gives it a status code about how that transaction went. Was it all okay? Which would be a 200 code. <coughs> don't know what you're talking about. A 404, which you'll kind of know. Um, server's confused, I don't know what's going on. 500. Um, there's quite a lot of these, actually. There's kind of about 31 in total. Um, there are also different methods. So the general method is get, which is just saying to the server, I would like to get a resource. But there's other things. Post is used quite a lot in web forms, which is I'm going to post information to you. So there's lots of different types of methods that you can use over HTTP. But it is a standard. Um, oh, hold on. So what, what I thought I'd do is rather than talk about it in an abstract sense, is actually show you um, a couple of things about how HTTP works. So what I'm going to do here is fire up a proxy. And all a proxy is is just a little bit of software that sits in between. No, not today. Uh, between everything. Now, what I haven't done is tested if I've got internet, but I assume I do. Yes. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Actually, let's go to the Designers Fiesta site. There we go. Okay. So. All a proxy is going to do is it's going to sit in the middle of all these transactions and it's going to let me see what's going on. So if I refresh this page now, you'll immediately see all these calls that are being made out. So each one of these is a request. I'm going to stop recording so it doesn't keep going. So each one of these calls is a request to a different service. So just with that one simple web page, and there's not much to that page, there's a little bit of information. Um, some graphics, some text, a video, um, all that kind of stuff. Not a huge amount, pretty simple one-page website, probably built in a day or so. But there's a lot going on here. So it's not just a question of, I'm going to a web server and getting a web page and bringing it back. There's an awful lot going on. So let's look at the main site. So this is the, the principal call made to the designersfiesta.com domain. Um, you can see already that it's obviously WordPress-based, so it's bringing in a bunch of things here. Um, but let's just look at the default call. So when the, you type in designersfiesta.com, what that's doing is it's going over first to the DNS service to say, what is the address of this name? That's then giving an IP address, which is being returned back. Um, you can see it there. That's that bit there. Um, and then it's giving a request, and it's saying basically, I want some information from this site. Now, the default on that site is to give you the index. So... This is what the request looks like. This is a standard HTTP request. Every HTTP request looks exactly the same as this. So you have uh, the method. I want to get this rather than post. I've got the host. I've got various bits of metadata around cache, around the user agent. It's sending my user agent, so <coughs> where, what, what machine is giving it, um, which is then how we kind of dive to mobile and all that kind of stuff if we want to. Um, it's got a cookie in here, which is passed to it as well. And it's got various other bits of metadata, like language and the encoding type that it can be used. So that's the request that gets sent out to the server. The server then has a response. And if I show you the header first, before the other thing, the server said, hey, yeah, fantastic. OK, I've got that resource. 200, it's OK. We're all working out. So here's that resource back. Uh, by the way, I'm, my server is based on Nginx rather than Apache or other server types, and I'll talk about that in the stack. Here's the date and time that you got it, and here's a bunch of other metadata about the, the resource that you've requested. And the thing that is actually returned, if we look at the raw request, that's the header at the top, and then you'll immediately recognize this as the HTML of the page. So put it into HTML mode, and you can see that a bit more clearly. So this is the HTML of the page. That is all that's returned, just that HTML file. 
the browser then has to take that HTML file and needs to say, okay, great, I've got some HTML, I've got something that I can understand now, and it's going to pass it, it's going to go through it line by line and understand all the things that it needs. So what things does it need? Well, it needs the things that are in here. And for each thing that it needs, it makes a new request out to the server. So it needs images, it needs JavaScript, it needs, in the themes bit, if anyone knows WordPress, you'll know where this is, it needs CSS to style it. So it's the same thing again. There's the request, and there's the response, and that's with the CSS that responds back. And then the browser says, fantastic, okay, I've got that now. Now I understand how I'm going to lay this page out. And now I'm going to understand how scripts need to run. And now I'm going to understand what colors things should be. And it's going to build the page. And we'll go into that in a bit further days, uh, um, in a bit. So if I actually go back to the primary call, um, I can give you a summary of all of the calls that are made just to display that one web page. <coughs> So every single one of these files is a request made to the server. <laughs> and you can see the code that the, um, uh, the uh, request the server returns with. All 200, all good. There's no missing resources, no mistakes in the code. Uh, the type of files they are, PNGs, JavaScript files, CSS. Size of the header, which is pretty standard normally. Um, the size of the file itself and the time it's taken to get that request back. So you can see how these requests quickly, oh, yeah, sorry, um, really, really quickly stack up. One of the big things about web performance, which I'll talk about in a minute, in, isn't just page weight, it's not just the size of it, it's how much thinking the server has to do. How many requests do I need to make with, with my bandwidth? How much information do I need to pass? And the best way often to optimize web pages is to really think about how many requests am I really gonna make with this? Do I need, loads of different JavaScript files, you know, can I just pull, J pull jQuery down and just use that? Uh, and it's really about, uh, also the other thing which you'll immediately notice is that's just one request from there because the page also needs some other things. It wants to speak to Google Analytics so it knows how many people are there. It's got a rich font so it's making a call out here to uh, Google Fonts. So again, request, that's slightly different actually response, and then there's the font face information. It's making a request out to YouTube. It's got some stuff with Eventbrite, which is a third party events management thing. We've got more fonts here. Uh, that's the font data itself, um, coming from a different source. Um, and then there's, I don't even know what that is, mixed panel or something weird. Um, uh, Kind of thing. Um, so, so you, you, you can see that there's an awful lot of information and an awful lot of requests over to the server that are being made, even just to, to, to display a very, very simple web page. Okay. So the stack is something that we talk about quite a lot um, as developers. And really what this is talking about are the interdependencies of all these different things. So this is a very, very typical stack. Um, this bit here is the web server itself. And the web server is just a computer. So computers need an operating system in order to make all their component parts talk together. So most commonly, it tends to be Linux of one flavor or another. Um, sometimes it's Windows. Um, anything kind of .NET based or that kind of thing would be running on a Windows server. Um, the operating system sits there. It's configured like a normal operating system to a large extent. And it's just a normal computer, effectively. Um, but obviously, it's not a computer that needs a GUI. It doesn't need like an interface or, or, or applications in the traditional sense. But it does need the environment in order to run those applications, the applications that we're going to code. Um, so on top of it, you have a web server. And the web server is the thing that takes that request in. So when the user's browser says, I want to go something, this is where it comes into. So you saw in the, in the uh, Charles example of the previous the Academy class example, um, uh, that server was Nginx. Apache is the most common still. But <coughs> Nginx, fantastic, much, much quicker. Um, there's also other services. So that will also have email on it, mail senders, which is still using TCP IP, but on a different port. Um, and that will run as a service. FTP will run as a service. There's loads and loads of different services that might run on that one server. You've got databases, obviously, which won't go into in any detail. And then above all of that, you've got the application layer. So this might be PHP, it might be .NET. These are the things that the server itself, we can write code for to make the server pass requests and do certain things. So the most common thing will be, I'm gonna get a request into the web server. The web server's gonna say, okay, this guy has asked me 
for my website, and I need to give him that website. But what do I need to do to give him that website? I can't just give him the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, because he might have given me something very specific, like a search term, that I need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the application layer. The application layer is going to understand that request, and it's going to say, oh, right, okay, I need to construct a web page to send back to this guy. So let me go to the database. Let me get to the information that I need from the database, from a search or whatever. I'll make a query and say, okay, I've looked for cake recipes. Give me all your cake recipes. And it's then going to send it back to the application layer. The application layer is then going to say, right, okay, I need to put that in there and that in there and that in there and that in there. And then I need to make that HTML and that JavaScript and CSS. And those are the things I'm going to send back out. And so that HTML will then go back into the user browser. The user browser will then say, fantastic, I've got all the HTML I need. Uh, now I need these images, this CSS, and this JavaScript. And back it goes round and round and round until everything is rendered and ready to go. Um, it's called a stack because these things essentially stack up on top of one another. They are interdependent. Um, the operating system is fundamental. Things then build up. Um, we often group these stacks together. So LAMP is one of the most common ones. That is Linux on the bottom. Uh, my, uh, sorry, Apache as the web server. MySQL as the database. And PHP as the uh, application technology. So LAMP is a standard, and you'll meet people who describe themselves as LAMP developers. WordPress is but largely built on LAMP. There are others, though. .NET is obviously very common. Uh, ASP, Ruby, you'll come across, which is awesome. Um, we're increasingly working in a technology called Node, which is a, uh, I've actually put it in here, but it's slightly odd, because that does actually work as a, 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 a server. Um, so it's kind of both. Um, uh, Node is fantastic because it's built in pure JavaScript, so it's ultra, ultra fast because it's written just purely in the language that all the browsers understand. Um, that is often combined with a bunch of other technologies like Mongo, for instance, and you get the mean stack, which is all those technologies together. So these things are interrelated. Now, we often talk about the two sides of this, the front end and the back end. And the front end, I, I'm guessing that the large majority of you guys are designers or creatives or maybe PMs, and, and it's the front end normally that we're kind of mostly concerned about. And the back end is for the gigs in the basement to kind of deal with. Um, um, something very important about the front end stack, which I'm going to talk about again in a minute, is that this is executed at runtime by the client itself. So as you see, it takes the HTML, it pulls it in, it then finds out the things it needs, and it writes uh, uh, each bit of information as it needs it. But that's happening in real time at the point that you request it. So this is, in some ways, not massively efficient, but it's also very, very dynamic. Um, so it takes that web page, receives the HTML, passes it, makes all these requests for the resources, and this is known as the critical rendering path, which I'm going to go into in detail in just a second. Um, this also explains why there's such differences between web browsers and devices and all, all these different platforms, because they're all interpreting the code differently. There's not a standard, you know, so it's why it's impossible just to get a Photoshop output and build that exactly as it is in Photoshop, because uh, it's not a controlled environment. We don't really have much control over how the browser does these things. We have a little bit, and when you're uh, a practice developer, then you certainly do. Um, but a lot of the problems that we have with interoperability between different types of browser is because of this, is because the browsers are all making their own decisions, and particularly different vendors have different ideas how it needs to be done. You know, uh, there are standards that are set by the W3C, and, and most of us work to those standards, um, but then Microsoft decides just to trip out and do its own thing, and uh, you know, uh, Apple have suddenly decided they don't want to use WebKit anymore, and they're gonna build their own, and there's a lot of politics and positioning and all these kind of things. So this thing, even though we've been working in the web for 15 years, and I've been developing on the web for 15 years, and I have been every single time, you know, finally we're going to get a standard. We can just write one set of code and it's going to work perfectly. 15 years later, we're still doing the same shit. So anyway, um, that's the front end, and those are the kind of problems you get with it. Um, the back end stack, this is executed on the server. So as I was just explaining, this runs processes um, and compiles those resources ready to send out. Um, so, as we just explained, this overall time of response, all these things have got to happen. So it's actually quite remarkable when you think about it, that when you type in a web address and then send it out, and you know, if you're bitching about not getting your web page back within three seconds, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So this is the same stack that I showed you here, but properly. So this is actually a stack, it's not a LAMP stack, actually it's slightly different, it's based on Ruby, but this is a stack that we have recently designed for a project which is launching next month. Um, 
<laughs> I'm not going to go into this in any detail at all. Um, we'll do a private session later if anyone's really into it. Um, <laughs> um, so um, there's all kinds of things going on here. You know, you can see still we've got the operating system here still, then it's at the bottom, and we've got Ruby, the application, and we've got uh, a web server which kind of really is up here for some reason because we design it slightly differently when we do it properly. Um, we've got Postgres, which is our database. Um, we've got a number of instances of database, not just one, lots of different types. There's one for the user details, there's one for editorial uh, information, there's another one for content, actually. Um, we've got search indexing, uh, which is we've seen, which is actually written in Java. So this is another application. Link. So we're not just running one Ruby, we're running Ruby and Java on the server because we need it for different parts of it. And all these things interlink together and they all build up and another level. We've got Node in here as well for some tasks. Um, this is the front end bit, just here. So you'll recognize, for instance, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But we don't actually write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We write things in Haml, and we write in SAS, and we write in all these abstracted languages to make things work really, really quickly and be really efficient in development. So when you actually get deep into the technology of it, it's quite complex. Um, and they're all interreliant and all interdependent. You don't need to worry about that. Okay, so when we talk about interpreting code at runtime, what are we actually talking about? When the browser gets this HTML and this JavaScript and this CSS and wants to display it on the page, what is it actually doing? Well, all code is basically just structured logic. That's all it is. Um, you know, code itself is very, very easy to learn. I mean, literally anybody can learn how to code. What I think is very, very difficult is understanding some of these principles behind it, but in particular is understanding the logic, the way that you've actually got to kind of make your brain think. It's a little bit like if any of you have worked in 2D uh, for your life in design and then you suddenly start working in 3D and you've got to go, oh my God, this doesn't make sense. I'm looking at 3D and a 2D and uh, it's that kind of thing. You know, it's the logical leaps, particularly when things get complex. Um, the code is passed, which means it's read, and then it's executed, which means it's run. And the point at which this happens is called runtime. Um, I was going to go into a kind of deep thing about synchronous and asynchronous, but it's probably not a big deal. I think we're running out of time a little bit. So um, all, all that basically means is, and you will have heard Ajax, which in the A in Ajax is asynchronous. It just means the order in which things are happening. Why it is quite important. Um, any project managers here? Good, I can insult them. Fantastic. Right, any of you work with project managers? Okay, right. So you know when a project manager comes up to you and they say, right, Guys, I've got a list of tasks that need to be done. We need these templates building. We need these things designing. Can you do these? Anything? Right, fantastic. Okay, I'm going to start doing that. Uh, start going through the tasks one by one by one by one. Okay, that, that's a synchronous line. It's going, you're doing your tasks one by one by one. And then what tends to happen is another project manager comes up and says, dude, like, oh, seriously, I'm in real, really, really deep trouble. The client's losing the plot. I need you to do this right now. And you say, oh, fuck, okay, great. You go over there, and then you do that task. And your other tasks have to stop. And that's what happens in a synchronous uh, logical flow all the processing of everything else has to stop. Asynchronous is when you're a technical director like me and the project manager comes up to you and says, yes, fantastic, I can sort that out. Uh, Dave, can you do it? And you give that task over to another process and you can continue on your, your task, but the other process is happening in the background and returning it back. And that's what happens in Ajax. So we're not making a new server request in Ajax. So when we want a new piece of information, to put into the page, so you click on something and you want to quickly go and get a Google map, for instance, we don't have to go all the way to the server and get a whole new web page and bring it all in and display it. Instead, we're just going to go, okay, look, I'm really busy rendering this web page right now, but I just need that map. So can you just make a little tiny, quiet, no, don't tell anyone, request, and bring that back and pop it into the page. And that's an asynchronous request. Um, when we get complex with code, it needs to be structured well. I desperately love to go into a deep explanation of MVC with you, but I like you, so I won't. Uh, this is what a web page looks like, so we all know this, okay? I, look, you guys probably know a lot of this, so I'm not going to go into any kind of depth, but this is a bit of an anatomy, and I'll show the deck around as well, so if you're interested in this further, it's quite wordy, some of this stuff as well. Um, the thing is with markup, is all markup is, all HTML is, is just a descriptor of what these things are. It's giving the browser information and why the browser needs this information is because when it gets rendered, it needs to create a model, an object model, which is called the DOM, or the document object model. It needs to create this object model for a page. All these different bits, it needs to understand, first, this head information. The stuff in here is never rendered on screen. This is where you understand all the dependencies of the page, like CSS and JavaScript and that kind of thing. What do I need to make this page work 
the way I wanted to. Um, it's also got metadata in and other little bits and pieces that we can throw in. It might have the character encoding. So uh, if you're using extended character sets for localization, it might have some of that information in. Um, the body is the meat of it. This is what we're going to display. And each one of these things is semantic. So this is a header, and it's because it's a header, it's got a, a header element. And with the HTML5 specification, they've expanded that out massively. And it's very important, wherever you can, to make that markup make sense not just to twist it around like we used to in the old days when we put everything in tables, because that was the only way to make things lay out the way we wanted to. But instead, this has got absolutely nothing to do with how this looks on the page. So I won't go in depth into that. Um, so what happens when the browser gets all the information it needs to display this page? It's got the HTML, it's got the content, the server has kind of put all this together in the back end and it's given it over and we've got a successful HTTP request coming back to the browser. The browser's then made all the other requests for all the things it needs, all the images and the CSS and the JavaScript and the weird calls to analytics and everything else that we seem to think is so important to show these things. It's got all this information. It says, right, I need to now render this. I need to draw this on the screen. So what I'm doing here is really breaking down that process of just simply typing in a web address and bringing, putting a web page up. It's a lot more involved than this. And this is called the critical rendering part. Um, don't worry about this so much, actually, I need a better image for that. But um, um, There's a lot of work that this browser has to do. And a lot of the issues around performance are normally about uh, overburdening the server, but particularly overburdening the client, and particularly when you're thinking about mobile. So I know, we'll, you know responsive is obviously the, the kind of, you know, the, the really big thing that we all do a lot of work in at the moment. And responsive is tricky because you're actually requesting the same resources, by and large, with a few exceptions, that you are from the full desktop site, whereas old mobile sites would be specifically optimized for mobile, no big assets, that kind of stuff. But in responsive sites, you're rendering the same code. And actually, the problem actually often isn't page weight or bandwidth or, you know, I always have clients saying, oh, but what if I'm on 3G or, you know, what if I'm on uh, HPSA and I can't get a fast connection? And it's like, well, actually, that's the least of your problems. The biggest problem normally is the power of that device in the browser. If you've got a slow running browser on a slightly older phone, it's probably because it can't deal with all this thinking that it's got to do. Um, so optimizing performance is about really breaking this down and understanding all of these kind of things. And I think for designers as well, this is quite important when you're thinking about, particularly in a responsive context, about how things alter and how things, you know, it's why the best method for responsive normally is mobile first, is to consider the mobile and then build up progressively and enhance out to the more capable platforms. So this is what happens when a browser passes the HTML. So as I mentioned before, you have this document object model, DOM, which is constructed from the markup. So it goes through the markup, the HTML, and it says, right, okay, that's a heading and that's a paragraph, and that paragraph has an ID, and I'm gonna remember that ID because down the line somewhere, CSS might need to say to that ID, I want everything with the ID of Andy to be orange, and we all go and do that. Um, it can be addressed with JavaScript as well. Um, after it's got the document object model, it goes to, over to the CSS, which it's now loaded in, and it says, right, fantastic, okay, CSS, this is what I need to do, and I need, all these things need to be laid out, and this forms what's called the render tree. So it now knows all of the elements that it needs to play, display on the page, and it needs to know, and it also knows how they want it to be laid out, how they want it to be styled, how much padding they want it in. So all the stuff that you're doing in Photoshop, when you're laying something out and deciding when you've gutters and margins and font size and colors and all this kind of stuff. This is what the browser is now doing. It's, we've coded that, put it in, into this kind of code, and the browser is now saying, okay, I need to understand this code, and, and it's making all these decisions about how to lay it out. We then take this render tree and it's passed to the layout engine and it ranges all these elements on the screen. And once it's happy with it, it then it renders and it paints it on the screen. After that, JavaScript is run. There are some exceptions to that, but generally, unless it explicitly defined as async and, and other things, it will block the flow of the page, but generally speaking, that's why we kind of have them at the end, and then JavaScript is run, and all the functional stuff is thrown in, the carousels work, and all that stuff. Now, this obviously happens really, really kind of quick. Um, this is a massive simplification in many ways. Um, there is a great primer on the link here um, when I distribute the deck. Um, also, with this one, this Google document about the critical rendering path, it, it, it's quite technical, it's quite geeky, you want to fall asleep, it's amazing, but it's actually, it's really, really good as well. It does give you a lot of fundamentals. So these are really kind of good primers, and it's, it's kind of good to understand it. So the example I've given here is, 
when a client says to you, man, that page looks really slow, or, or it doesn't look like the Photoshop, or any of these kind of things, it is a bit like saying, my car sounds a bit funny. Uh, you know, the mechanic effectively might have to completely strip the engine to understand why. You know, so we're giving this kind of very high level view because we think that that's how it works. But actually, there's a lot of kind of work and understanding to do. And so when a developer says to you, I'm having a nightmare debugging this, I thought I could do it in an hour, but it's taken me a week. They're not just playing Minecraft. They really are probably, hopefully, if they work for me, um, um, uh, kind of really stripping that down, using the tools like I showed you to already understand exactly what is going on in that browser. And that's the best way that you'll get the optimization. And it's also, most importantly for many of you, the best way that you'll guarantee that your design vision is carried through right into the code. So now when your developer bullshits you, you'll be able to, you'll be able to say, um, uh, it's the critical rendering path, man. Just chill. So, how does this make digital media differ um, from every other kind of media? Um, okay, well, it differs in a few ways. Um, traditional media, broadcast and print media, and, and a lot of things, and maybe some of you are trained in those more traditional media forms as designers, um, or work in both. It's very common in agencies now to work across both. Um, and there's something that always blows my mind, actually, when I speak to clients. Uh, clients of major, major, major companies, and head of digital and CEOs and you know, really serious people who, who are still uh, head of digital marketing for a brand that will remain nameless, but um, you know, who basically just understands the media plan and, and, and literally doesn't think there's any difference between the TV ad and the website um, because they just think of it in terms of a communication channel. But there are some really major differences. So the first one is dynamic. And this thing about runtime, because the browser is rendering that page at runtime, effectively, this asset, this creative that we're putting out there, is, is created at the point of consumption. So it's not like we go and we make a film or we build a poster and then we go and get it printed and we put it up and it's the same for everybody. It's dynamic. It can change at that point of consumption. We can personalize it. We can inject new kind of things. We can, ha we can consider users with different needs, which is why accessibility is so important in a lot of these sites. It's also interactive. So the site itself can alter on the interactions with the consumer and other stimulus. And we tend to do this in a pretty simple way most of the time, carousels and, and clicks and all this kind of thing. But there's a lot more that we could do with it. Um, and then it's interpreted, lastly, which means that it can be consumed by lots of different ways and lots of different audiences. And, you know, personalization on the web, I think, is a touchy subject in some ways because a lot of the time it's just not that good because we're all individual subjective human beings and not algorithms. But um, putting the tools in the hands of the user to help them filter and understand content is the way things are going. And this is going to bring us on quite nicely to this. So I'm going to battle, rattle through this a little bit because I've only got about 10 minutes, but um, APIs. You all come across APIs one way or another? Um, so what an API is, um, imagine that you, uh, you had your website and your application and you wanted somebody else to be able to use some of this, not just the content, but some of the functionality in your website um, and some of the content in your database. And one way of doing that would be to say, right, I'm going to completely embed you within it. I'm going to give you access to all of this kind of stuff and you can run on the same server and you can have all the information, but that probably wouldn't be a very kind of sensible move for the security of your data or your application or whatever else. So an API, all it is, is called an application programming interface, and it's just an abstraction of that, just a little kind of lets you access certain functions or return certain information. Um, and then your partner application can send, again, HTTP, same type of request over to this, and then... It might return HTML like a web server, but it probably doesn't need to, because all it might want is some information. So, for instance, one of the most common uses of an API would be with things like Facebook and Twitter and social media. One of them is, oh, well, so if you've ever authorized another uh, application to use your Facebook information, you're using the Facebook OAuth API, which authenticates you as a Facebook user against that. So instead of this application needing to build its own registration system, you can just simply go over to Facebook and it can say, Hey, listen, I've got this dude who wants to use my website. I want to know who they are. Um, can you authenticate their details? Facebook will put up a window and it will say, yeah, give me your details. And then Facebook will say, okay, cool. Uh, are you happy for this site to use your details and for us to rinse all of your personal information for the rest of your life? And it will go, yeah, fantastic. Okay, all good. Those details are correct. Go ahead and use that information. Now, every time my application now wants to verify some of Facebook information, it doesn't have to know all of what's going on in Facebook. 
It just simply has to say, hey, here's this dude again, is he all good? And you say, yeah, he's all good, here's the information. So that's basically how it works. Um, the transaction often needs to be authorised, obviously we just talked about that. Um, the partner application is always dependent on the API service being available, which is why you must be very careful about when you build on third-party services. Tempting though it often is, just to say, oh, we don't need registration, we can just you know, let Facebook do it. Okay, but what happens when they change their business model, like Twitter is doing rapidly at the moment, um, or change their API, which happens quite frequently, or, and then everything breaks, so you've got to be careful with that. Um, when we're doing that authentication thing, when we're going and getting this thing, we don't need to bring the whole of Facebook into this application. We just need that one bit of information. So we've authenticated, we say, yeah, and it's all good, go for it. Um, but then it might just want to know who my top five friends are, or my first five friends. So it's like, great, okay, well, all I need is that bit of information. So I don't need HTML, JavaScript, CSS, all the things to render that, because I'm going to render that in my own way. I just want the data. So we use a structured data format, uh, XML. Um, often, but the most common is JSON. JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's basically just native JavaScript as, as an object. And that means it's ultra, ultra quick because browsers understand JavaScript. They don't have to go through an XML file and say, oh God, right, I've got to deal with this now and process it. Because it's JavaScript, it just goes bang and understands it straight away. Um, so actually, I'm going to show you an example of this as well. Hopefully, if I can remember this. Oh, a security problem has occurred. Of course it has. Why has that occurred? Rubbish. Have I lost? Oh, maybe that's why that wasn't working. Then. I lost internet. I'm not going to show you an example. Oh, that's really, really frustrating because that's brilliant. Okay. Um, tell you what, though, what we will do while we're here, exciting, is I'll show you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now it's working. So I was going to show you what uh, an incorrect uh, HTTP error code looked like. Because <laughs> that was clearly working. Anyway, it's decided to work now, so that's fantastic. Right, so this is just an explorer for the API. So what I'm going to do is make a request, in this case to Instagram. Instagram has a bunch of APIs which let other developers use their content and their functionality in exactly this way. You know, we can't embed the whole of Instagram in my site, but I can use bits and pieces of it. Um, so what I'm going to do here, and I bet you're fiber, I can't remember to do this is I am going to, these are all the methods that I can use in the API. So these are the things that the API is going to let me do. So I've got users, I can return user IDs, I can return my feed, I can return relationships. And you'll see the HTTP method here that I talked about. These are mostly get, but I can also post. So if I want to post a relationship and update my information through this, I can post information to the server as well. I can delete, that's another HTTP method. So if I want to delete a comment through my own app, um, I can do that using that kind of request. And these are all HTTP, all exactly the same. Uh, return tags, locations, likes, comments, media, all this kind of stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to do, let's try this one, I think. So, uh, users self feed. Um, within this template, I need to. Actually, is that all right? Okay, let's do that in a second. It's not actually the one I want. Hold on. Sorry, bear with me. I think it's that one, maybe. Yes, right, okay. So you'll see here, um, it's going to return this user, and it's going to ask for a user ID. So this is a parameter, this user ID thing here. And that HTTP request is just a URL. So what I'm going to send over to the server is just basically a URL, constructed just like a normal web page URL. But that last element is going to be my user ID. So my Instagram user ID is DTNL. I think. I'm going to send that request. It's got a problem. Okay, no problem. Um, it's got an immediate problem here. And the reason why it's got a problem is that I haven't given it authentication. Um, I haven't said, hey, I'm Andy and this is my Instagram account. I'm up for it. So let's put an OAuth, like we just discussed. We'll sign in with Instagram. 
There you go, Instagram is all right. I was already signed into it, so it's given me it. And now I'm going to send that request again. And then bang, straight away. Okay, so same as before, HTTP header. Get header, that's the request. This is the response. It's given me a 404, then it's not found, so I've obviously got my name wrong. Oh my god, oh, I didn't enter it in. So, right, so the server in this case has returned me and said, it's not 200 all those it's 404, that resource isn't found, I don't understand. You're going to have to try again. So let's try again, and so I'll put my Instagram in, and we'll send it. And hopefully now, <laughs> we'll still get a 404. Okay, that's a bit weird, maybe that isn't my name then. So it's gone down again. Uh, okay, you get the general idea. Oh no, well, that's weird. It has returned some stuff. Okay. It's very, it's very oh, hold on. I know what I'm doing wrong. Ignore me. <laughs> really, really frustrating. Okay, uh, weirdness going on. Right. Okay, ignore me. Well, let's cut to the chase. Uh, what you would normally have seen is beautifully constructed data from my API coming back. Anyway, I was saying, right, I'm going to go through these really quickly. I've only got five minutes. So, um, the cloud. Um, we all know what the cloud is, right? Distributed computing services. So instead of one server, we've got lots and lots and lots of servers kind of dotted around and sharing resources and doing things in a really groovy way. The um, reason why this is quite cool is because traditionally, in the old school web model, you would have a single server with all that information, and the request would come in and go to that server and then come back. But actually, that's not very good if you've got lots of different touch points that you want to link together. So this is the old school method of doing it, client, server, database, back to server, back to client. But instead, what we'd like to do is abstract these different services. So we might have our client still, but we might have the application, which will be a server and a database. And these things might run even on the same server, but we have these separate services. We have the application. We might have identity. Who am I? We might have personal content and functionality. We might have my preferences for a particular application. And because we're now working with sites not just as consuming information, but as actual applications and little like pieces of software, we're using them in this way, it's really useful to separate these things out into this architecture. So with Facebook, for instance, it does this very, very well. And, and identity is its own module. And what that means is that if I want to authenticate Pinterest against Facebook, Pinterest doesn't have to deal with all of this. It can just deal with the identity part. So it's separation of these concerns. And when we talk about the logic of code or the logic of technology or any of these things, most of the struggle that we're always going to have is making the right decisions architecturally and making these things all kind of lay out. Two more things. Um, the physical world. This is now going to be increasingly important. Um, I've actually managed to lose nearly three stone with Fitbit, which is just the most awesome thing in the world. Love it. Um, because what it's doing is it's connecting me to my lifestyle. It's making me really self-aware. So I'm a massively unself-aware person. And what I really love, because I'm a big geek, is that technology gives me a self-awareness. It lets me know, what am I actually doing? And it's doing it in the same methods. It's still by and large, HTTP, kind of. Um, and it's still the same data transfer. It's the same types of data, so it's JSON again. And that means that it can go into the web. But then I've also got an API, which means I can pull this over. So I can kind of do a thing in the morning. I could write a quick application, which would tell me, rather than just the Fitbit's thing, it would say, if I haven't hit my 10,000 step goal of every single day, it's going to kick me out of bed an hour early and say, go for a run, you lazy fuck. So it's going to do things like this, right? And, 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 and like, this is a really, really kind of exciting time because we're going out of the thing of just what web content do we want to do, but how are we going to make this information useful to people? How are we going to take it out of just a designer believes that content should be displayed that way or a business believes that their business should only be consumed in one way? And instead, we're going to kind of get all this information and data and, 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 and connect us all to it. And I think this is going to be the really kind of exciting next phase of the web. So what's next and how do we go about it? Moore's Law, I'm sure you will know about. Computers only get faster, smaller, lighter, cheaper. Um, it always astonishes me the amount of stuff that we now have in our pockets on these things and you know, really beyond the dreams of Star Trek kind of thing. Um, and technology is the driver for this. So guys like me will be big evangelists for it, obviously. Um, but to be of practical use, we need to consider the culture of how people use it and the culture of our everyday lives. That's quite important. Um, 
to stay abreast of this, to keep up with that crazy diagram that you saw at the end and how quickly everything kind of moves, um, you need to be playing and exploring. And R&D is really, really important. So not just doing the work that you're asked to do, but constantly exploring this stuff, experimenting, trying different kind of things. And then finally coming together both at events like this and on blogs and in meetups and, and sharing those ideas. Open source is really, really important. We would not be where we are in the development of the web right now if this was a commercial operation. So open sourcing, sharing of these ideas is massively, massively important and I certainly encourage you to do it. I hope that was useful to you um, and not too geeky. Um, I think we're running short on time so we can't do official questions but I'm around for a little bit if anyone's got any questions. Um, I will share the deck and I've recorded the session as well. So thank you very much for listening.